you're with like a group of 10 people and everyone else has already ordered a burger and fries and you order a salad. Well, almost everybody at that table is going to actually be sort of hating you <laughs> subtly. And they'll talk to you. They'll ask you about it. Like, oh, oh, you ordered a salad. Cool, man. You didn't order the, the you know, the bacon burger with the fry. Like, what, what's the deal? You'll like get that. And you're like, what do you mean? That my decision to order the salad has absolutely nothing to do with you. But there is an implicit rebuke of their decision, you know, from their perspective. And I think that can happen really often when you're trying to uh, frugalize your life, let's say. Hello and welcome to the Lewis and Kyle Show, an interview podcast where my friend Lewis and I interview high-performing people. We've interviewed entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, rappers, and the like. It's been an incredible experience, and we have a great episode for you today. In this conversation, we're joined by Scott Rickens. Scott is a thought leader, and you could call him an influencer, in the financial independence retire early space, referred to as to FIRE. Hopefully, uh, when spelled out on paper, that acronym is obvious, but listening to it, it might not have been as obvious. But Scott was a former creative media producer for his own company, for another company. Uh, but when he found out about the financial independence retire early movement, he was captivated by it and realized that the entire movement did not have a proper feature length documentary. So he set out to create that for himself. Uh, it's now on Amazon Prime Video. I've watched it. It's very good. He had awesome participants in the project like Ryan Holiday, The Minimalists from Matt Diavella's Minimalism documentary, uh, Mr. Money Mustache, Pete Adney, same person, uh, who's a kind of cult leader in the space and many other fire participants. He also wrote a great book, which is actually how I found him through his website, which has interesting tools uh, that I'll encourage you to check out after listening to this episode to kind of do some fire math in your own head. And now he lives in Bend, Oregon, where he continues to spread the fire mission, teach about it, and also invest in real estate. In this episode, Scott joins us to talk about why fire is good, who he made his documentary for, his life in Bend, Oregon, which is actually the number one remote work capital of America, apparently, um, how to find financial independence and retire early, as well as the future of online communities. It was a great episode, and we're going to cut to it now. Scott, welcome to the Lewis and Kyle Show. We're excited to do this podcast today. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I really do appreciate it. I found your book through Google and then watched the documentary through the website, and I've just been enjoying your content ever since probably October, November. Uh, so I'm glad we could get this on the calendar. The financial independence retire early is one of those buzzwords I feel that we kind of have to cover as podcasters in the entrepreneurship, investing, personal development space. You know, we've done a couple podcasts about Bitcoin, we've done a couple ones about, you know, the 75 hard, should you run a marathon, this diet, that diet. And so this is one of those essential topics that's just in the zeitgeist and very, very important. I don't think it's a trend that's going away anytime soon. So I want to ask you about some misconceptions in the space, just to clear this up right off the bat. You have a sticker on your website currently sold out. So congrats on that. Uh, the difference between frugal and cheap. What are the differences between those two ideas? Great question. And by the way, I'm so excited that fire is in the zeitgeist and uh, part of the essentials uh, list. That's incredible. I can't tell you from from where it started for me to where to how you're describing it. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, and to to answer that awesome question, uh, uh, the sticker it alludes to the idea that frugal does not equal cheap. And the idea is that uh, the way I see it anyway is cheap is when uh, you are being frugal at others' expense, and being frugal is when you're being frugal for yourself. Uh, and so I do think that there is a delineation there and something that's worth uh, calling out. And I actually created a sticker about that because that whole set of stickers that we did sell, the idea was to own certain mentalities that may be perceived as difficult um, or the types of things that would uh, prevent people from joining the fire movement. Um, I wanted to sort of lean into them and make them more of a rallying cry because oftentimes, as I saw anyway, when learning about the fire movement and then meeting a bunch of the people in the fire movement and then going out and sort of preaching the gospel to some extent. Um, I recognized where the fail points were, where people would fall off. And to me, this idea as a whole is far more important than getting caught up in the nuances of, Oh, I don't want to be cheap or I don't want I don't want deprivation when, you know, people might be missing the point. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's where that sticker mentality comes from. Yeah, I like that a lot. I think that with the whole fire movement, a lot of people kind of 
mischaracterize it as being just, you know, spend less, save more, invest wisely, and you'll retire sooner. And I'm like, if it was that simple, there wouldn't be like a cult following. So what do you think is the kind of essential elements of the FIRE movement that have made it like something people identify with and feel like it's important to their sense of identity uh, beyond just, you know, the simple gospel of live more frugally? Like, why is it really, even yourself, for example, like, why does it catch your attention enough to be such an activist for promoting it? Yeah, I think, I think once, once it took hold for me in my life, I recognized how fast and how swift, like those are the same words, how fast, uh, financial freedom, uh, sort of washed over us. Um, and that was something I thought would happen decades down the road. Uh, and, and financial independence and financial freedom for me, sort of two different things, I guess we can, you know, argue the nuances, but ultimately like with financial independence, as we see it as a, as a fire movement, you have this FI date, right? It's this date when, uh, your investments, uh, the, the dividends that are kicking off of your investments will cover, uh, your expenses on an annual basis. And then you've reached financial independence, whereas financial freedom to me is slightly different where you feel a sense of freedom around your money. And like I said, it didn't take very long to feel that feeling. Um, where you were more in control, you were in the driver's seat, you were taking control of this. And that's something that was completely foreign to me that I'd never felt prior. And so th that ultimately is the answer to why I felt evangelistic about this idea and really wanted to spend my time and my skill sets, my experience towards helping other people find this. It's not so much that I'm a money expert and I know everything there is to know about uh, you know, sound investment strategies, um, in, in, you know, very, very like off, you know, crazy corners of the world. It's not like, uh, I am some expert that you should bring into a university and have you have lecture about investment strategies. It's about, um, it's about the, the freedom that I didn't find while I was working my tail off, while I was doing all the things that all of my friends and all my family were doing, and I was thinking I was making perfectly normal decisions, when in reality, we were making decisions that were just causing that, that phi date, essentially, to get kicked down the road um, further and further. And so for me, and for a lot of people, I find there's a sort of realization, there's usually an inflection point, it might be uh, losing a job, it might be having a child, it might be having some sort of windfall event um for the positive or the negative financially and you start you start to take finances seriously and you start googling and the next thing you know if you're lucky enough you'll find this fire rabbit hole and you'll go down it and then you realize hopefully how to work backwards from understanding how much is enough and then working towards that goal and for me i never had any mon money mentorship i didn't understand uh finances enough to to you know be uh, responsible with my money, but even more importantly, um, I didn't have, uh, any guidance and I felt fearful. So when I was thinking about investment strategy, I felt like that would be a master's degree in and of itself to understand investing. And I think that might be a little bit by design from an investor standpoint. I mean, when you see the way they write the language, um, when you talk about, uh, you know, like, when you talk about fees, when you're investing and, and like, look at what they call fees. And it's like, this is purposefully uh, difficult. And why is that? You know? And so I don't know, I started getting a little conspiracy theory with it, but ultimately with fire, it made it so simple that I suddenly felt like there was a place for me. And I'm not like this. I'm not a, I'm not a math expert by any means. Um, but very quickly I started to realize how this all worked. And then I was doing mental math and I was doing it quickly to understand, you know, what, a, what kind of money, like a certain money decision, how it would affect my life down the road. And suddenly that was how I started to feel in control of my money. That was how we started to make some really good money decisions, um, you know, sort of back of the napkin math. Whereas in the past, um, that wasn't possible. I didn't know where to start because I didn't know what I was working toward. And so uh, that was... That was really powerful for me. And that's what I think is really powerful about the fire movement. Yeah. That was something that really resonated with me. Um, consuming some of your content in preparation for this interview is a way you framed sort of what you just said in that, um, purchases, you reframe the, the way you looked at spending money as giving up units of freedom in the future. 
And so, you know, a thousand dollar, um, iPad is no longer a thousand dollar iPad, but it's a piece of your freedom 10 years down the road because invested, you know, you, you get those returns and, and those dividends, um, eventually. And that really stuck with me the way that you framed that. Yeah, I think the, um, and, and we continue to make those types of decisions that way. And, you know, we're still on our journey to fight. We're still on that path. And, you know, just from a selfish sort of personal perspective, it's so wonderful to have those conversations with my wife. Whereas before, when we would talk about budgeting or we would talk about something we wanted to buy, you know, the decision was predicated on like, well, have you bought something for yourself recently? And if so, do you really need to do that again now? Um, or, um, you know, I just bought something big. So now maybe you shouldn't buy something big. And now maybe I'm starting to resent you for doing that because now it's preventing me from buying that thing. Like there was all that really messy, uh, those, those sort of messy dynamics were happening and we didn't know how to talk about it. We didn't know how to work through those things. And now we have this like collective money filter that we, we use. It's, um, it's sort of the same for both of us. And it's essentially, it's very simple. It's, you know, will this set us back? Uh, in our fight date, well, of course, anything that we spend money on technically would set us back. So then is it worth it? And is it worth it for me? And then coming to your spouse and saying, this feels worth it to me. Can I talk to you about that from your perspective? And it's just a completely different conversation. And you have to, it, it gave us a framework to be able to respect each other's perspective of maybe, uh, you know, a, a more selfish purchase. And that changed everything with our, our money language, essentially. And, uh, and I learned all this just through, uh, you know, Facebook groups and blog posts and podcasts. That's incredible. And that's really also unprecedented. It's like never been possible in history. And yeah, it's like, oh, Scott, you're really being rele rele relevatory here. Uh, you're talking about the internet and how incredible it is. It's like, yeah, I, I understand. But, um, but I do think this idea of community online is starting to mature. And, uh, and this is the type of thing where, I mean, I, I would ask you guys, have you seen other communities where that type of maturity is resulting in something that can be as life-changing as changing somebody's, you know, money trajectory, uh, the trajectory of their life financially, where they go from living paycheck to paycheck or, you know, working in a quote unquote dead end job or a job that they don't like, or that they're even apathetic uh, uh, about, which is in my case, in my opinion, like one of the worst things that can happen to suddenly being in control of their money and maybe deciding to stay at that job, whether they like it, don't like it, or even apathetic about it, but ultimately know that they've shaved decades off of that working career. And then at one point, whenever that point happens for them, they're in enough control where they can, they can change that job. They can shift their life. They can be happier with the way they're spending their time. I think there are a number of online communities that are like that. And I think, you know, they're all admirable for what they've done. I think some that come to mind for me, MJ DeMarco, he's the author of a book called the millionaire fast lane and unscripted. He has a forum called the fast lane forum. And that's, there's some very incredible stories on there of people sharing the businesses that they started based on the book that they read. And then they're all supportive with each other. I think the trends.vc community, not trends.vc, just trends. Uh, so we interviewed this woman named Steph Smith who runs that project. And that's a Facebook group where people share business ideas and then share relationships and things like that. And these online groups where people empower each other to, you know, just realize there are more efficient ways of navigating the universe in terms of like the U S economy and the realities of making money and enjoying your life. And then they're all very supportive and share resources. So I think it's incredible. And I agree with you that we're starting to see it mature, uh, and we're nowhere near maturity in terms of reaching the potential that it could realize. Absolutely. And obviously like open source development and cryptocurrencies and like, that's a whole another universe of people using the internet to collaborate, to innovate money and improve people's financial position. Uh, so I love the, and then I want to backtrack for a second to say, I think the, the big point from what you just said is the clarity that you had in your relationship. I had a question written down earlier about how does you feel about the guilt of spending money? And me, I was kind of thinking of this in terms of like frugal and cheap, right? Like if you're so concerned with saving money, like you feel guilty every time you spend money when in reality, it seems as if you've come up with a system where you actually feel less guilt than you had just because you're taking such a degree of intentionality and like forethought and you actually have opened the lines of communications about these topics. So the guilt and like the difficulty has actually been reduced. So that's something I hadn't even thought of going into this. I thought it would be the opposite. Yeah. And that's the type of, uh, myth essentially that we were trying to bust with the project that I, that I created where I was seeing that I was seeing that in the comments of blogs. I was, 
I was seeing that um, in the comments of a lot of the, the media opportunities that these early fire bloggers were getting, um, where it was just, com you know, completely shut down because, uh, you know, fr frugality was seen as deprivation. And um, yeah, and it was, it was amazing that the inverse could be true and that, you know, these weren't mutually, mutually exclusive. So yeah, it was, it was pretty fun for us too. And, and by the way, you know, what, what, another thing that happens in that scenario where if you do really truly decide to pursue FI and you can get your, yourself into a situation where you're not living paycheck to, pay, to paycheck, but instead you have an excess of, of, you know, uh, of net at the end of the month, suddenly those decisions aren't as big anymore either. Right. And so, um, the, the, the big spending decisions of the past become small, you know, spending decisions in the present. And that is also a very empowering, you know, financial freedom esque kind of thing that happens. Um, that said, you know, ultimately we have sort of set up this system where we kind of have an idea of these expenditures that aren't necessary, like, you know, housing, cars, and food. Um, we kind of know where those, uh, those line items are going to land generally, and we keep them in a general vicinity in our budget, but we aren't scrutinizing at the level that I do see some of, let's call my peers in the fire movement, um, scrutinizing them as, and that's completely dependent on your own personal journey. And that's another thing I want to just make sure is very clear with the fire journey idea or the fire movement is that yes, there is this incredible community online that's been empowered by the internet and been empowered by all these amazing people that have spent their time and their energy and their knowledge to share this. Um, at the same time, like there's no real set of rules or even leaders in the fire movement in my mind. There are, there are people that I enjoy learning from and listening to more than others, let's say, maybe that makes them a leader. Um, but ultimately, you know, they're still not defining the rules that I would have to follow. Anyone can follow their own rules. And the best part about this is you take, you take what you like about it. You take what you don't like about it and you move on, you know, and keep learning from other, uh, other opportunities. Like, I mean, crypto is a really good example. You were bringing that up earlier. Are we seeing online communities actually like back the idea of a currency so far so that it's like, it, it didn't reach like a trillion dollars, mm -hmm. um, in valuation mm -hmm. just a few months back. I mean, that could not have happened, I don't think, without without this same sort of um, mechanism of, you know, these online communities. So anyway, I, I, I do think we're, we're starting to see them mature, but they are, they're still in their infancy. And if they're already creating currencies and movements that uh, enable financial freedom, which perhaps cryptocurrency could become that for a lot of, a lot of nations around the world, we'll see, um, yeah. These well, are exciting times. Uh, you know, if you're interested in learning more about that, I definitely recommend 1729.com and the network state by Balaji's Balaji Sirinivasan. Um, He's the only about, Balaji on the internet. Right. <laughs> so you got the uh, first name and you'll find your way to him. A ton about, about network communities and just like how um, the future is in the cloud. Um, but I have a few points I want to talk about and touch on. So the first is just that, that money filter. I mean, that is such a powerful tool that I feel like if everybody used it and knew about it, it would r eliminate so many relationship problems. And then on the other half of that, and this touches on some things you were saying, it's like w one really good heuristic that I um, come back to is like, when you have a lot of money or when you have no money, money will solve all your problems. But when you have a lot of money, money solves none of your problems. And so it's like this, this base layer, I feel like uh, that is FI and like learning how to save your money and just learning about it all in general, um, does so much good for people. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't solve any of their non money related problems, but by clearing that out of the way, it's like, then they can think about other things and allow them to, to, to move on. And then I had a question. So what is your money filter calculation? Is it just like 7% compounded 10 years? Like, how does that, how does that work? Yeah. I mean, that's definitely sort of the, the templated idea of how you can calculate the, uh, the effects of that, mm -hmm. of that particular purchase. Um, I think at this point, um, you know, yeah, on the, on the bigger, on the bigger purchases, um, what we're trying to do as best as possible is if we're making a big purchase, it's an asset. It's not a depreciating asset. Mm. It's a, you know, appreciating asset. 
And so we're really, usually we're not using the 7%. We're trying to figure out what will this be? Uh, you know, it, what kind of cash on cash return can Talk we get if language. we're doing rent, you know, real estate? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, or and, and what we're starting to do is we're saying, okay, that or should be put in the stock market and we can expect these types of returns mm-hmm. over the 30 years. You know, are we doing buy and hold or are we doing a, you know, a live and flip? Like, you know, it's, it's like all these different uh, investment strategies uh, when I'm talking about money filters these days, that's pretty much all we're talking about. When cool. it comes to whether or not I should go down to Starbucks and get a cold brew or something, I'm not sure that that's a really, mm-hmm. really a factor anymore. Right. Whereas before it was, and um, and so you know that's for us, that's our money filter now. But to answer your question, I mean, when we were starting to develop that money filter, that's exactly what we were doing. We were going backwards and saying, how much are we spending on these things? Like. The whole latte factor thing it's a lot of heat now like oh you know like i see you see a lot of snark on twitter about that um i think somebody the one that i really thought was wonderful was it was something about elon and crypto and then he tied into lattes and they were like well elon lost this much in crypto today which actually equates to like this many lattes so moral of the story is you know it's just like so great um because it was trillions of lattes <laughs> but Unfortunately, I mean, as much as I do like those jokes, like, and I, and I can, I can get down with them. Like at the same time, it sort of misses the point, which is that it's not about a specific latte or like that, that type of deprivation is going to then make you achieve financial independence. The idea was that we knew that those purchases were stacking up, but we didn't want to even open up that can of worms. We didn't even want to look at that. We tried to budget a couple times prior to finding fire and we would do it for a month or two or whatever, but. The problem that we found after the fact, we realized what the problem was, was that it felt like deprivation to simply budget for the sake of budgeting. What we didn't have, mm. the power that we found, was we figured out what was our goal. You know, what was this, how do you work backwards from this goal? And before we could figure that out, we had to understand what made us happy, what made us tick on a, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, and not like some big, huge plan, because that, uh, turned into sort of a lottery mentality way to live when we were thinking like well one day we'll have this nice house and we'll live in this place and we'll have these things that all would create this sort of lottery mentality way of life where it's like they'll happen someday in the meantime i'm going to go do this thing i'm going to go do that thing i'm going to go spend this money i'm going to go spend that money um and we were able to do that to some extent because we were earning you know we we we've had a lot of advantages in our life we've gone to college we've done all these things we're working our tails off we're getting good jobs we're fairly competent you know so on and so forth and that was just masking the necessity to figure out what is really important to us what makes us tick um what what's important to us down the road what's important to us five years ten years down the road I'm married to this woman for six, seven, eight years. We've never had those discussions. Mm. That was a real, that was a real problem. You know, that was a real, that's a bummer that that hadn't happened before. Luckily, the, learning about the fire movement, it was, it became very clear that we should be discussing what makes us happy now, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, and work backwards from that. Cause now I have a framework to use to understand how to achieve those things. And we're smart enough to figure that out. And I had never had that sort of, you know, step-by-step model with fairly safe assumptions. I mean, about the safest assumptions you can get from an investment standpoint um, to utilize as a backstop to making those decisions. So that's ultimately sort of the, the money filter that I'm talking about is you start with what makes you happy on a weekly basis personally. And if you're with, if you're with someone, if you have a spouse or, or a significant other of any kind, what, or a roommate, a friend, do it with anybody that you can. I mean, it's always better together. What makes you happy? All right, how can we work on this together um, so that you're getting what you need to be happy, I'm getting what I need to be happy. Now, all of a sudden, that money filter, like those money decisions are completely different than, um, well, I'm assuming I know what makes you happy and I'm assuming, or you're assuming you know what makes me happy. And so when I'm asking you if I can spend money on this thing, you're just making all these assumptions about what makes me happy. That's a terrible system as opposed to uh, you've given me the tools to know what makes you happy and vice versa. Now let's talk about what we want together um, over the over the future and let's work backwards from that predicated on really conservative estimates on, um, on, on our investment strategy. And then let's see how that, how that journey plays out. And every once in a while something comes up and hey, that might set us back a year or two. Is that worth it to you? I don't know. Let me think about it like that, as opposed to, 
I, I want to go do this thing. I want to go take a, you know, cruise in Europe. Um, we haven't treated ourselves in a while. I deserve it. I've been working hard. Yeah, that all might be true. Um, but is it worth it to you to set yourself back where you have to work another year or two at this job that you're at now to go and do that thing? Is that worth it to you? That's, that's like the best way I can describe our money filter now is it's not even really pen to paper as much as it is. We already kind of know, you know, how much something costs versus like how long that'll take to, uh, ex how long will that extend our FI date? And is it worth it to you in that context? And if it is, then let's have a real discussion about it. Let's sit down, talk about it, maybe even put pen to paper. But it's so much easier to make those decisions without even having to break out the ink um, as, it, as it was before. I think that kind of answers a little bit of one of my earlier questions about, you know, why has this caught on? And besides the fact that the message is simple, right? You teach people, you know, a, a couple of lectures worth of math and compound interest and a couple of lectures about index fund investing and s spend less, invest more and X, Y, Z. And it's like, why is this caught on? And I think it's kind of like a, I'm going to use the term Trojan horse effect, right? It's like, because you have that, it all of a sudden tricks you or forces you into having these other really important conversations that just so happen to really improve your life. Then you're crediting the movement with that cause. And that's kind of like why, you know, someone like Jordan Peterson is an advocate for saying, you know, just clean up your room because you clean up your room. Then all of a sudden you like start to care about your appearance. Then all these other things kind of fall into place. So that's starting to piece together for me a little bit. So one more really common criticism of fire that I haven't totally been able to resolve yet. I, obviously, as I was just elaborating, I think like no matter who you are, it's extremely useful to be intentional about thinking about your retirement date based on what you have, thinking about your spending. Uh, but a lot of people see fire as kind of like a race to the bottom. So if you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year and you're currently spending 50 and you get really, really, you know, intentional about the activities you do to have fun, the type of car you drive, where you live, and you can whittle that down to 30. Then if you're really creative, you can whittle that down to 25 or 20. Uh, whereas if you focus on increasing your income, theoretically, there's no ceiling, you know, you could just earn an extra hundred thousand and it doesn't matter if you're spending 60, cause you know, you're still net better than where you were chasing that 30 down to 25. And I hope people were able to follow along with those numbers. Uh, but how do you think about the dynamic of, should I focus on, you know, decreasing the bottom line or increasing the top line, uh, as far as spending less versus earning more? I think, you know, those are really interesting dynamics within the fire construct. Uh, I don't know if I have, you know, personally, I just kind of see them as they are where you, you know, if you are here and your like, if your paycheck is here and your expenses are here, uh, then I would say the first thing that you want to look at is how can you decrease your spending? That said, a lot of times when you are living paycheck to paycheck, you have people who have already done that. Um, and, and so I don't want to speak for them when they're like, yeah, that's, this all sounds great, but I have already, you know, I've already moved and, uh, cut all these costs and drive a really old car and all these things. I don't have anywhere to cut. Um, at that point, yeah, at that, at that point, it's just math, right? You, you have to increase your income to have extra at the end of the month. At that point, to me, those people technically have already developed that muscle. They already know what brings them happiness, what doesn't. They've already cut all those costs. They're in the best position oftentimes to ultimately pursue the fire movement. But now they're going to be looking outside. Not, I mean, not so much these days, but back then you would have had to look outside the fire movement to, to learn more about increasing your income, um, finding ways to negotiate higher salaries, things like that. Um, and I think, you know, Ramit Seth, Seth he talks a lot about that. Um, negotiate, he's all about negotiations. Um, there's a lot of different uh, places online where you can find that now. And these days, there's people in the fire movement. I know the Choose Five guys talk about this a lot. A lot of other people that talk about how to increase your income, uh, how to negotiate salary raises without having to pick up your family and move or make these other huge drastic changes in your life, uh, like things that I did. So you know that's sort of the bottom of the the rung. And then on the on the flip side, you've got people who yeah they earn a lot. They're they're high earners, but they're also spending a lot. And I think you know that's these are the people that oftentimes need the most work um, where, you know, you've been doing a lot of retail therapy. You're doing a lot of, uh, you know, just kind of coasting and that's a, That can be a comfortable place for a long time. But I think, you know, people that are interested in this, that are in that position, typically uh, there's a reason and there's something gnawing at them. There's something that's not quite right here. This isn't fulfilling enough. 
And um, that's where the real work begins. Yeah, because I mean, they have the easiest path where, look, you've got this, you've got, you've got a lot of income coming in, you've inflated your lifestyle, you know, for a fact that there's plenty of things you could cut, that's the best place to be, it, it takes a month or two. And, and all of a sudden, you've got, you, you know, you're in the black, and you can start putting this, uh, putting this net towards great investments that are completely conservative, good to go. And now the real work begins. Who do you want to be? What do you want to do? And I don't know, to me, it's like, you think about it, like you think about all these social dynamics when it comes to money. Those are all incredibly important. And some of the best work in the fire movement, hands down, are coming from people who understand all these different social dynamics. And you know, the, the more broad this thing gets, the more we can learn from it. But at the end of the day, from the math problem perspective, um, it's pretty cut and dry to your question. To me yeah. though, the most important thing about this is, man, imagine a scenario where you have someone who's advantaged. They, they have everything they need to succeed and they are quote unquote succeeding. And yet they're apathetic at their job. What are they doing for the world if they are apathetic at their job? Well, let's say their job's very, very important to the world. Well, okay, great. And if you're apathetic at best, like maybe those people are a net gain to the world. But for anyone who's making widgets or doing something that someone else could replace them to do and they're apathetic at it, they are doing so much damage to so many different scenarios here, right? They're doing damage to themselves because they're not fulfilled, so they're not happy. They're taking up space from someone who might love that job, need that job, right? And and so like think about the think about the downstream effects of that scenario. And if fire could grab a percentage of those people and lift them out of that and give them the courage or the tools to get a better job or a job that excites them more, more fulfilled. Uh, that they have a happier life, more fulfilled life. Think about the downstream effects, the multi-generational effects that that could have. That's where I get really excited. I think that's where the fire movement has a chance, you know, at really, really being something really meaning, really meaningful. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And I think that's a really good answer to, uh, the question you know, I had posed to you about earning versus saving Kyle and I are kind of workshopping an idea, uh, called low hanging fruit. H L H F and then high leverage fruit. So kind of, that's how like we were thinking about with, with the podcast where, you know, what are the easy things we could be doing to, you know, improve the show, do better. And we should do this first. But then once those are all out of the way, then we focus on the, you know, improving via addition, not improving via subtra subtraction. But for most people in most situations, the lowest hanging fruit is, you know, taking your car from a $500 a month car that you don't even Brings, doesn't bring you any pleasure to like saving that it's you can do that overnight where you can't you know increase your monthly income by four hundred dollars with the, the switch of a finger and then only once that's taken care of should you be focusing on these next steps what are you gonna hop on in kyle yeah yeah so let me let me hop on in uh you know i really like the um the message that you're teaching about working backward from what makes you happy and like if your car, your Mustang is like the coolest thing in the world to you and it's worth $400 a month and it's like where you derive your, your happiness from, then of course you shouldn't cut that out. But like, exactly. like you were saying earlier in the, in the podcast, uh, you weren't saying it, but I was listening to you talk, um, about Coronado and like how the beach didn't make the top 10 and either you or your wife's list. And it's like, well, we are, well, this has an outsized impact on our, on our balance sheet and on our income statement. It's like, well, then if it's not in the top 10 of top 20 things that make us happy, we really need to reevaluate whether or not this makes sense. Um, and so just the framework of working backward from what makes you happy, I think is, is super powerful when talking about, you know, making more money or, or it's just, it's where it, everything needs to be derived from. And all these, all these questions sort of answer themselves individually. They do. And I, I should, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up as well. Cause I, I fear that I've painted too rosy a picture up to this point. And one of the things that I think needs to be considered, considered is you have all these big decisions when you start to really unveil what really makes you happy. And maybe the decisions that you've made that have brought you here, especially if you're coasting or you just haven't. You haven't had the tools to really consider that, or you haven't had the 
opportunity, the advantages to be able to consider that. As we mentioned earlier, you know, once you get that stuff out of the way, you get to start really thinking about yourself and being a little more selfish and working on yourself, eating healthier, taking care of yourself. Like all these things can really open up once you're not stressed and worried and fearful about where the next paycheck's coming from or if you're going to be able to pay your bills and all these things. Once all your money and problems and, are solved. You know, yeah, right. We're going back to that. And so, you know, here's this other issue that happens. I think one of the biggest, um, hurdles of the fire movement is in, uh, we had Ryan holiday on the documentary and one of my favorite moments, uh, 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 in all of the, uh, interviews. And there were a lot, uh, he talks about the implicit rebuke and it's this idea that like you sit down at a restaurant and let's say it's a burger restaurant and you order the salad. And you're with like a group of 10 people and everyone else has already ordered, ordered a burger and fries and you order a salad. Well, almost everybody at that table is going to actually be sort of hating you <laughs> subtly. And they'll talk to you. They'll ask you about it. Like, oh, oh, you ordered a salad. Cool, man. You didn't order the, the you know, the bacon burger with the fry. Like, what, what's the deal? You'll like get that. And you're like, what do you mean? My decision to order the salad has absolutely nothing to do with you. But there is an implicit rebuke of their decision, you know, from their perspective. And I think that can happen really often when you're trying to uh, frugalize your life, let's say, when you're trying to make these big cuts, these big decisions. I mean, we had people, when we were making some of these decisions, we had people questioning us like, did you join a cult? What's going on? Because your identity is changing. Mm -hmm. It's shifting as we speak. And it happens, for us, it happened quick, honestly. I can't imagine a scenario where it happens super slow. If you see this stuff and you haven't seen it before, it, it's, it's like an awakening. It's a Harajuku moment and you're going to start making drastic changes if you can. And either way, me mentally, you're going to start feeling that way. And so it's, it's your identity is fundamentally shifting and that can have a lot of profound effects on your social dynamics. So I, I just want to, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't bring that up, that there are definitely, you know, consequences to all of these actions. Um, but it's a matter of, you know, what's more important, you know, the people at the table that want to feel better about eating, eating their burger while you eat your salad, you know, what's more important that, or are you eating the salad and maintaining a healthy habit and still being there, still being with your friends, you know, and ultimately you can lead by example. And if you continue on that path and you look them dead in the eye and say, this is a decision I'm making for myself and I'm really, you know, it's a choice, uh, and this is what I'm doing. I, I maybe you lose some friends. All right. You know, maybe that's, maybe that's a problem. Maybe it isn't. Um, but fast forward six months, I bet half that table's eating salads because, you know, you start leading by example and that can have downstream effects. Yeah. I would be remiss if I didn't mention a thing that Lewis and I have learned on this podcast many times. It started with Dickie Bush. Um, where he uses this thing as a litmus test for, for new friends when he says his big goal, which is to bring an NBA team to Tampa, Florida. Like that's what it, he's like, I'm going to do that. And he says the people who laugh in his face are the ones that he doesn't want to talk to. And the ones who are like, well, how can I help? Those, are, those are the ones that he oh, picks man. to be their friends. And so it's like, I think, that's great. um, you know, what you're talking about is a little bit different because you know, you don't want to just not be friends with your friends because they're they got a burger but like if one guy is like i hate you for not ordering a burger and like i'm never gonna <laughs> go to a restaurant with you ever again it's like right. maybe that might be a problem. maybe that's yeah. the one you want to cut out you know exactly <laughs> and i think you make that sound you know a little unreal kyle specifically with the the burger example it sounds unrealistic but when uh, to bring this back in context, if you're someone and all of your friends, you had a fancy golf membership or you all had some other like truly more identity based habit or behavior that was also very expensive that you chose to change. Like that's actually a realistic scenario. The burger thing is realistic too. I've gone through a lot of diets and affected a lot of people uh, and made them think about what they're eating for good or for bad, but specifically it can be very, very challenging in those, in those other contexts. But I do want to ask a completely different question now. Uh, I'll tap into a different source of knowledge that you have that would be useful to us and our audience. Uh, so you have a very thorough back. Obviously, like this is like you said, a uh, kind of precondition for having this conversation is having a you know moderately successful career. You're making enough money to be able to think about these things, and you have a strong background in advertising. You made a very you know well professionally done documentary. It's on Amazon Prime. People can watch it. Uh, I want to ask you how you marketed the documentary because Kyle and I get a lot of feedback that we do an okay job as interviewers. You know, uh, people like the show. 
but we're not very good at promoting it. So I'm curious what your strategies were for, you know, having your art piece, this documentary and getting the awareness to actually have it, have a successful launch and be something people talk about. Uh, first of all, thank you for all those compliments. Second of all, I agree. Uh, you guys are running a great show. I listened to a few episodes before I came on. And I also can tell, I've done a lot of these podcasts now, and I can tell the level of preparation you guys have put into this is, it's honestly astounding. So thank you for that. I appreciate it very much. I'm sure your guests do as well. Um, the fact that you haven't been found more is uh, a travesty. And, uh, and let's talk about that. Um, first of all, the way I looked at it was, uh, I'm going to make this for the fire movement um, while I'm making it but I'm not actually making it for them. I'm making it for the people who need this. And so I wanna leverage the FIRE movement to help me build this thing for everyone else. So I looked at it like it was community first always. It was, I need to, I need to learn about the FIRE movement. I need to immerse myself in the FIRE movement and hopefully become one of the people in the FIRE movement. And by doing so, um, as long as I maintain trust I do things with integrity, I should be able to have them support me. And that proved to be true. Um, I, I don't think this is profound advice. I mean, these days community is becoming like, I think, I think it's becoming more and more of a focal point, even in the, you know, the advertising agency world that I came from. Um, I can think of, you know, Greg Eisenberg is someone who I was starting to follow predicated on the idea of excuse me, he started, uh, he, he's, he does a lot of writing and he was writing something about unbundling Reddit. And what he's ultimately talking about is going into Reddit to find these niche communities and building things for these niche communities. Uh, it's a gold mine. It's a treasure trove, um, of finding not only communities, but then what they, where there are gaps, where there are holes in these communities and how you can fill those holes, how you can provide something for them and utilize them while you're building it. Um, you know, that's not going to work in every scenario. In fact, I, w I was a prolific Redditor back in the day. Uh, and I thought that the financial independence subreddits would be stoked about the idea of having a documentary done about this subculture. And it turns out that the famous Reddit snark and, <laughs> and sort of, you know, that whole vibe and mentality, um, uh, that was very prevalent in that subreddit as well. And so, it got shot down pretty quick as like this sort of money grab project, which it wasn't, uh, and still to this day isn't. Uh, but um, I decided to move away from, you know, trying to essentially promote it there and just start connecting. And I will say, I mean, email, by the way, I'm sure you guys heard this too, but email, holy cow, that is absolutely the number one best thing I did was set up an email uh, newsletter early, early on, because all these other platforms, nothing compares to the strength of that email list. Those, those are the people that started with me that are here with me now. And I get to talk to them intimately and they know it's coming from me. And, uh, I, I have been blown away by the power that that's given me to affect change, do things I want to do, come up with new ideas, vet those ideas, all those things. Um, but yeah, ultimately to, I'm straying a little bit, but to get back to your question, how I approached, uh, creating this documentary was, I need to do it at a high level. Uh, I want to try to do the best production value I can do to sort of lend credence and respectability to this movement as it is. Um, I want to build the trust of this audience. I need to, to do that. I need to understand them. I need to be one of them. I need to go to the, the places I need to go. Um, like literally physically conferences, uh, camps, you know, meetups, all these things and put in that work. Um, from there, you start to learn the vernacular, you start to understand the perspectives, the, the, the highs and lows, like the things you need to avoid, the things you need to learn more about, you know, and you're going to go, I, I tripped, I made mistakes. I did a lot of things, right. A lot of things wrong and tried to learn from them and did the best that I could to do it openly and with the community. That was a big deal. I had never done that before. It was very scary. Um, to sort of like say, Hey, we're going to work on this thing now. Uh, like a Kickstarter campaign, I'm going to launch it in a month. And then like three months later, I'm going to launch it in a month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you're literally showing your failure, but that ended up working to my advantage. And the more I did it, the more comfortable I got, it's still a struggle, but the more I did it, the more comfortable I got. And 
it was amazing how all these penalties and all these things that were going to happen in my mind just never happened, never materialized. And the things that, uh, that came from it were so powerful and so wonderful. And so, um, yeah, so impactful to this project. Uh, I, I couldn't believe it, but it, it was right. So maybe, maybe it's just helpful to hear it again. It's like focus on that community, serve that community, listen to that community, build in front of that community and be willing to take some hits, be willing to, you know, to learn, to say when you're wrong. And all that's going to do is build trust and, and, and it's all real, you know? Um, I think the people that follow me on, on the, the email, like I write those emails for better or for worse. I'm not the best writer in the world. Uh, I try to, I try to almost speak as I write, you know? And, um, I think, I think that's because that's like one of the places where my message resonates the most. I think that's why, um, and so, yeah. And then, you know, here's another little fun fact. When we did the Kickstarter campaign, uh, I got a message from the internal Kickstarter team. Uh, there are actually humans back there. I didn't know that. Uh, and, uh, they, they wrote me and they're like, okay, I think we were launching the next day. And I got this email and it was like, Hey, uh, I've been working with this, uh, this awesome person. I think her name was Katie. It's been a few years, but Katie wrote me and we've been going back and forth on a bunch of different details. And I finally got the campaign ready to launch. And I'm so nervous because this was a huge inflection point because mm -hmm. Kickstarter as, as itself, it's, it really is its own marketing campaign, uh, almost more so than the fundraising part it also mattered to us to fundraise and there's all these nuances, right? Like the goal that you set, if you don't hit that goal, you don't get anything. Those are some stakes. And, um, and so anyway, we got that all lined up. I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm going to launch it at this conference called FinCon. We're in Orlando, I believe at the time. And I'm sitting down by this pool waiting for some people to fly in. And I get this email from the Kickstarter team and they're like, Hey, just so you know, congratulations on your launch tomorrow. We're really looking forward to it. If you need anything else, let me know. Also PS, uh, the entire office has a running bet going because we're fascinated by this campaign. Uh, we're like half of the room really loves your campaign and thinks you're going to do well. And the other half thinks there's absolutely no way you can raise any money from a bunch of frugal people. <laughs> it's like the nicest and worst email I could possibly get the day before I launched my campaign. I was so nervous. I hadn't even considered that really, that that was a possibility because up to that point, I'd gotten a lot of support from the fire movement, but I'd never asked them for money until that moment. And, um, turns out this particular movement is as generous as they come. Uh, you know, when they're, it's, it's funny. It's like, they spend lavishly on things that they care about and that brings them happiness because that's been their money filter for a long time, you know, but they cut hard on the things that don't matter to them. Luckily we proved that out, <laughs> but, uh, but ultimately I think that was also the power of community. And, and so, um, yeah, I, I guess a way to put that is, is like, if I can raise money from people who are literally <laughs> frugal minded, then like you guys can, can conquer the world. Well, I really appreciate that. I think, you know, you started off that answer and I think you answered the, the question in the first five seconds and you're like, well, I was making it for these people. It's like, that is something that Lewis and I, you know, we don't, we, we want to help people, but like, I feel like up to this point, we've definitely helped ourselves more than we've helped other people with the Lewis and Kyle show. And that's not a bad thing necessarily, but I think that we're on a journey on a path to find the people that we are going or that we are helping. Um, and, and that in doing so that's when we will, you know, find success with this podcast, I guess, or, or get to numbers that we think, um, accurately represent the, the time energy, um, that we put into it. Um, and so I, I really, have you think... guys worked backwards? I mean, I think one, one thing that's really helpful is, uh, defining what is enough, mm -hmm. you know, once you know what is enough, then you're going to be set. Then you can work backwards from that. Well, the, that's um, the problem is it's already enough. That, we, yeah. you know, we already like, we're already really happy with the results and like what's happened. Like, I don't know. We use the word success me, loosely. Right. I, I don't know how yeah. to, I guess success is helping other people, right. Is helping, helping more people than we're currently helping. Um, and so, yeah, it's a long winded way of saying you did a really good job because you started with, I want to help people find this community that helped me help my relationship. Um, 
and you know, I think that I can that I can ride alongside the people who know how much it is helpful to create this documentary to try and find more people to bring to the community. Yeah, I think another. Uh, I want to. I want to mention another thing. I, I recently learned that I might think might be helpful is. Uh, are you guys familiar with Tiago Forte mm -hmm. and building a second brain? So he has this great course for the listeners who don't know. Um, essentially, the idea is you build a second brain so that you can take all this influx of information that you get and you can store it away so that your your first brain can work on the creativity and the growth and just like being you. And then you can always pull from your second brain when you're ready to build and you're ready to to uh, uh, yeah, when you're ready to build. And um, he runs a cohort based course to do this, which is essentially like running a university class online. Um, it's, it's beyond, you know, sort of the traditional MOOCs, which is essentially, you know, uh, pre recorded video, uh, with like a syllabus. And then you run through that, you know, the, the retention rate on the, on those courses are crazy low under 10%. I think some are like 5% or less. Um, whereas when you do a cohort based course where there's live learning, there's live instructors, there's a lot going on, a lot of entertainment, uh, you're doing it with accountability with others. Uh, you know, the retention rates are sky high and. I've been doing a lot of research on this lately because we're building our own course for uh, for financial independence. With Maven, for people right? That, with Maven. Shout out Wes KO. Which, shout out Wes. Yeah, she's phenomenal. And she's one of the instructors teaching us how to create our own cohort-based course. Quite meta, but she's wonderful. And that team is wonderful. And one of the things that resonated me with uh, what Tiago said was um, – share 150 percent of everything you have mm. uh, what we're selling with the cohort based idea is you're selling the experience right and the accountability that peer-to-peer -peer learning creates and i wonder if you guys could figure out a way to share even more than what you share now like i'm very interested in your process i would like to watch you research uh people's projects and hear your thought process as you're preparing questions that might be helpful to your readers. Maybe not. That's just something I'm interested in. But as an example, to kind of think outside the box, mm -hmm. other than the traditional podcast format, how much can you share about your process and what you're doing? And you'd be surprised and delighted, I bet, on you know what those like, who that would impress, who that would help, and how they would then respond to that uh, to that sharing. And it's counterintuitive, right? Oh, we've got this course. We've been working our tails off to create the syllabus. Now let's share all of it for free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's counterintuitive to a capitalistic model. But what we know we can still monetize to compensate ourselves for those hours of work, for the mountains of you know sleepless nights, all those things, is we can create an experience and we can create a community around that experience. And that's really exciting. So again, it comes back to community. And I think that's ultimately the leverage, the value that you can bring is like creating that community creating that leverage uh, with your audience and then sharing it all. So I, I think that's the new way to do things these days. I loved what Tiago said about that. And I shared that I had learned that in our cohort. Uh, there's, it's like a hundred incredible creators creating courses on, on their backgrounds. Like we have one creator who literally went to, I think it was the state of Texas legislative legislation and like changed the laws so that she could create a cohort based course to um, facilitate uh, credentials for her field, just to run the cohort based course, like, these people are on another level. And um, that said, like, I shared this with them, and everybody resonated with that idea. And I think it is it, because it's counterintuitive, it doesn't, it do, it's not jumping off on paper, let me share everything. Um, and as creators, I think that's it's a good thing because you didn't, you get that imposter syndrome. You try to you try to keep some stuff to yourself so that no one can ever find out, you know, how little you know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you guys deal with that. I do it all the time. So, yeah, I think one of our biggest struggles is, and this is something that's come up a lot, is it's very difficult to remember what it was like to not know something. Mm -hmm. So, we learn something and then we kind of forget that we didn't know that and assume everyone knows that thing. Uh, and that's very evident on our podcasts about crypto. We just throw around all these buzzwords without defining them for people who are extremely lost. And by the end of the interview, if they're still with us, thank you for that. Uh, those episodes, we could definitely help you out a little bit more than we have been. But I, I agree. I think the cohort-based course model is a great way to, one, I think it's like an improved 
improvement on the asynchronous course. Uh, in addition, I mean, it serves a separate need. And the, the model of that is very, if you're familiar with Russell Brunson at all, you know, he writes these books about online marketing and he claims that his highest level private cohorts of teaching is just, you know, you pay him a hundred thousand dollars to sit down with him for like two days. And all he does is just make sure you actually implement the same ideas from the book. It's people are just paying for the accountability, but he runs the loss leader on the ideas, but it's the accountability and personalization, uh, that really moves the needle for him. Kyle, I've got a few more questions. I don't know if you have one. I've, I've asked a lot. I can ask another one or pass it over to you right now. What do you I've think? got a quick one that I want to cover. Um, Let's but uh, well, okay. So I know you live in Coronado, first. Let's just call it the bonus right? rounds right? Bonus for round. posterity um, steak. So bonus I rounds. have actually a recurring nightmare about the Coronado bridge, the suspension bridge. And then I was wondering <laughs> yeah. if you had any, uh, light you could shed on that bridge. If there's any fact you know <laughs> about why it's, it's safe. Cause uh, for some reason it just sticks in my head. I went over it once when I was younger and it, I was, it's just so big and terrifying. And so now <laughs> I'll, I'll, it's like a dream where I'm like, I, nothing really happens. I'm just going up this bridge, but it's like, I gotta, I gotta face wow. this head on. Kyle and I were crossing yeah. the Mississippi a few weeks ago or the Tennessee river. And he's like, shut up until we cross the bridge. He wouldn't <laughs> let me talk until we were across the bridge well, safely. So yeah, when I lived in Coronado, I, I took that bridge, you know, daily uh, for years. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know how much I'm going to help. There, there wasn't one day where <laughs> there wasn't that slight uneasy feeling as you go over because it's so big and you're up so high. Um, I would just try my best to just kind of focus on the view. So I don't know if you can do this subconsciously in your dream where you start really focusing on that view, especially if you're coming over to Coronado looking at La Jolla. And, uh, and you know, that sort of like, you can literally see the curvature of the earth from up oh. there. It's so beautiful. It's so... Um, but I, I think, uh, one thing that started to help me was, uh, we spent a lot of time, uh, sailing on our friend's boat in the Coronado Bay, uh, in the San Diego Bay. Mm -hmm. And we would go under that bridge all the time to go back and forth between the two sides of the bay. And, um, every time we would go under that bridge, we had this, uh, they told us it was, it was sort of like a tradition that you had to do it. Uh, where you look up at the at the bridge, I mean, and where you actually go through, uh, where traffic is 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 qualified to go through, is about at the apex of the height of that bridge. And so, uh, as you're going under, you look up and you yell, "Hey, you big old bridge!" as long as loud as you can, and the whole boat does it, and it actually echoes back at you. <laughs> and um, I don't know, that was sort of grounding to me. Like as I was going over the top of it, I'd always just think about that, like the. All of us hanging out on a sailboat, just enjoying a beautiful sail on, on a you know beautiful Southern California, you know magic hour afternoon, and uh, that would always kind of like calm my nerves because I I gotta tell you like it's an unnerving bridge to drive over. It's so tall. I <laughs> I'm mean, sorry, Kyle. <laughs> I'm so glad that you had such a good answer to that. I really you know it was sort of a shot in the dark with that question. I'm also sort of trying to get Lewis back on. He said he's working on it. Sure. Um, so, you know, obviously uh, it's like, for me, it's like, should I do real estate or, or, or dividend investing? And it seems like you've sort of gone over to the, to the real estate side here recently. So can you walk through, um, sort of that decision-making process and what sorts of real estate investments you're making now? Yeah. Yeah. So for us, um, a diversified portfolio, you know, as we got you know, more ingrained in the investing world and felt a little more comfortable in it, it didn't necessarily have to be index fund investing all day, every day, mm -hmm. uh, like we had sort of originally set out to do and how I think fire sort of initiates. Uh, and you know, to some extent, I mean, there are plenty of fire bloggers that are in real estate and it's not a foreign concept by any means, but, um, I think we, yeah, we, we were a little evangelistic on the index fund thing at first. But ultimately, uh, there were a couple of factors that, that brought us over to the idea, the world of real estate. And I think, um, one, there's a book called Retire Early with Real Estate, uh, written by Chad Carson. And I just, we, we know him well, we know him personally. And he, in his book, really laid out all these wonderful options based on who you are, sort of like your persona, um, to you know, use real estate as leverage to retire early. And also, uh, you know, be able to enjoy generational wealth, something you can pass down a lot easier. And, um, and also it has a lot of other elements like entrepreneurship. 
Um, and also I come from like my whole family it, uh, is from Iowa and I just love working with my hands. I love that handyman mentality. If it's broke, fix it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, I was really itching. I'd been living in apartments for years that I didn't own. I was really itching to take care of a place to, you know, really exhibit that pride of ownership and to, and I also loved the idea of forcing appreciation. That feels like such a hack, right? And so when we got to Bend, um, you know, it was really interesting. We had the opportunity from moving from Coronado, um, we could live anywhere on the West Coast. And so we really, you know, took a hard look at all the things that made, made us tick that were important to us, put them on a list and then sort of, you know, did that filter uh, to figure out what would be what would be in contention. Then, then once we found those uh, areas that were in contention, we went and visited them as many of them as we could. Um, we only got to like two or three of them before we landed in Bend, and it was immediately apparent this place was magical in so many different ways. And then I learned when we got here that it actually was the um, remote working capital of the country per capita at the time that we got here, which was 2017, 2018. And at that time, I was very convinced that uh, remote work would be more and more prevalent as we moved into the future. And if this city was already being chosen by the lucky few who were already moving to remote work, that that would most likely continue. And as I, as we spent more time here, we understood why. Um, because we understand people who live in Seattle. My wife's family's from Seattle. We spent a lot of time there. Uh, there's a production company that I worked with on the film and they were good friends of mine for many years who we collaborated with many times. They were from Portland. We'd spent a lot of time in Portland. Um, we used to live in Reno and we used to go over to the Bay Area a lot and to uh, wine country a lot. Spent a lot of time in San Francisco. We kind of felt like we knew a lot of these people that lived in these coastal cities. and if they start going remote where they might want to live. And a lot of them might want to live in this smaller mountain town with less traffic and a slower pace of life and really good schools, all these things we were finding in Bend. And so I don't want to let the cat out of the bag about this town, but it kind of already has become this zoom community, but we just felt like it was a really great place to invest in real estate. And so we had to add that to our portfolio and we ended up um, focusing on short-term rental real estate here because there are, uh, there's a permitting process involved. So it's like a little mini monopoly. So if you can get your hands on one, mm. they're, you know, they're really, it's about as sure a thing as you can get. So yeah, that's what, that's what led us, uh, all those, that amalgamation of information so kind of led us to. So is it mostly single family homes? Just that's what you're looking at? Okay. Yeah. And it's, and it's very, it's a very conservative approach. I'm not looking to, you know, build into multifamily and then see how many doors I can get or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's really like, we would actually prefer if our real estate in, uh, investment portfolio covers our monthly, uh, and that, and then we can, uh, use the, the stocks and all that stuff. I'd rather just not touch them. Mm -hmm. I'd rather like, just let that sit and grow. And if we can, if we can, uh, actually fund our lifestyle off our real estate, that to us was sort of our best case scenario. And if in doing that, I also get to work on the houses. And like, it kind of fits all the boxes. Not only do I like the handyman aspect of it, but I also really like the back and forth. Um, I feel like I have sort of like a semi career in PR just from running this brand and mm -hmm. this whole project. And so, uh, you know, just, just doing the property management side of things. Uh, also it just, my, all my skill sets lend to that. So it kind of essentially awesome. gives me something to do. Yeah. I think that you'll, I think you'll end up in multi. I think you'll end up with some multi, but that remains to be <laughs> That's seen. what everybody says, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, well, I think we're coming up towards the end of our time. So I just have one more fun question. I saw on your Instagram, some, some chickens. Do you raise chickens? <laughs> uh, no, uh, oh, those are probably damn. from Hawaii. Uh, I'm sorry. I would love to, uh, we don't have enough space around here, but, um, yeah, we were in Kauai, I think when it might've been Kauai or, or Maui, but yeah, we spend a considerable amount of time over in Hawaii. And, um, I have a fun story about that actually, Perfect. uh, the, the, uh, the chickens. So Kauai, if you ever visit the Island of Kauai, um, it's sort of overrun by chickens. Like you'll see t-shirts with chick chickens on them with like Kauai, Hawaii, whatever. And, um, I actually lived in Hawaii for three years when I was growing up, um, third through fifth grade. My dad was in the Navy, so we kind of traveled all around. And he was stationed in Oahu, but we, we, uh, 
you know, we traveled through all the islands and as an adult, like it's kind of feels like a second home. We go there as often as we can. Um, when I was living in Hawaii, it was 1992 and one of the only, uh, uh, hurricanes to hit land in, in Hawaii. It, it was called Hurricane Iniki in 1992. And the eye of that hurricane went right over the island of Kauai. So they got hit the hardest. Um, I remember being evacuated into my little elementary school because it was all, it was built out of concrete um, during that time in Oahu. But Kauai took a huge hit. And all these people that had chickens, all those chicken coops went flying. And the chickens got out. And that sort of is how no the island is overrun with chickens is from the 1992 hurricane in Iki. And not a lot of people know that about Hawaii, but if you see chickens on the side of the road, it's pretty much because of an Iki. The more, you know, what a cool uh, that is a fun, <laughs> obscure place to, uh, to close this interview off. I like how our interviews have that cadence of starting on topic and ending with uh, sky chickens. And uh, that's fun. I want to ask you, I was on your website, uh, a bunch of times, but specifically again today, you have a really good start here page uh, that kind of catalogs and sequences uh, your approach to getting into FI, getting into FI slash FI. And what is the link to that place? And where else should people stay in touch with you? Any other calls to action based on all the stuff you do in the world? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that compliment. That's high praise. Um, yeah, so the website is playingwithfire.co. Uh, you can find that start here in the top level navigation. I'm not sure I remember the URL of that one specifically. I highly recommend, uh, if you're interested in any of this, to uh, sign up to the newsletter. Uh, that is a fairly active, but not too active newsletter. Um, we only try to create content when it's necessary. Um, also, I've been, so during COVID, I actually spent a lot of time in all of the interviews that we shot over the course of about two years with that, in, with that uh, documentary. And I was able to pull out, God, I think it was 136 um, clips worthy of sharing, essentially. Uh, and I've been putting those out on YouTube periodically for about three or four months now. And we've got a couple, um, there's a couple in there that I, I just would be remiss if I didn't, you know, implore people to go check out, essentially. Uh, look for, the, the, there's a recent one that we just posted that's one of my favorite clips of all time. I'll never forget sitting there and watching this interview. It was with Vicky Robin, and the title of it is um, Phi is Just the Beginning. So go check out the YouTube channel, maybe subscribe if you like it, and check out that video, Phi is Just the Beginning. She takes, she equates the uh, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, which is sort of a structural um, theory for storytelling, and she equates that all, like as a Phi journey, and it's, it's genius. It's like poetry. Um, so I highly recommend people check that out. And then yeah, in the newsletter, if you do sign up, um, and of course on the site, we're starting a new cohort-based course, which will essentially be a six-week course uh, with myself, uh, my partner, Robert Shea, who's a certified financial planner and a big fan of the FIRE movement. And of course, we're going to be bringing in a bunch of guests, uh, mostly cast from the documentary and other friends that we've made along the way. Uh, and we're going to be creating this experience. And we're doing it right now, and we're working with the team at Maven to create that. Um, so the first cohort will be launched on Maven uh, this summer sometime. So definitely check that out. We've got uh, 350 plus applicants at this point. Um, so I'm not sure if uh, you know anyone signing up now will be a part of the first cohort. We're still determining how big we want to make the first one. We might make it kind of small so we can go make a lot of mistakes uh, and then go from there. But um, I think it's going to be a heck of a fun experience. And I'm a big believer personally that DIT is better than DIY. So I'd rather do it together. I'd rather do it with peers, friends. Um, and so that's what we're going to be creating. So, yeah. Well, Scott, awesome. thank you very much for coming on our podcast and sharing all that with us. We'll have links to, to everything that you mentioned below in the description. Um, you know, I think what you're doing is, is really great for the world as well as yourself. And so, um, you know, I hope that you're encouraged because of that. Uh, we are grateful for you to come on and that's the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And, uh, please keep doing what you do. Cause I really do enjoy the, uh, the podcast. I've been listening to it as I go for my walks in the morning. So you've got a fan of me as well. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And that wraps up our conversation with Scott Rickens, a really cool guy. Um, he was really good at talking and, and he had very good answers to every question. I was very impressed. Um, my three takeaways are the first one is about how Lewis, um, 
And I had sort of been thinking about it before. It's like the upside to the amount of money you can make is infinite. And the downside of the money you can save is, is limited. And so if you focus more on, on making more money, um, I think that that's interesting. But one thought that I've had since we started this podcast is just the relative ease of making more money when you have some money to work with is is way higher. And so I think um, that while that is true over the long run, that if you save a lot uh, now, it makes it a lot easier for you to capitalize on that, um, you know, that upside, the unlimited upside of being able to expand your income as big as you want to, as you can. Um, two, it's what do you care about? When Scott was first starting this whole journey, he had his wife and himself do this um, this exercise where they wrote out the 10 top things that they really care about. And I think that, you know, I've never done that. And I, I don't think people do that often enough is just looking at their life and thinking like, what actually, what do I actually care about? What actually brings me happiness? And like, how do I optimize for those things? And when you do that, it puts into perspective the amount of money you're spending on things that you don't really care about. And then the third is about online communities. I think Scott is just starting to dip his toes and well, he's made a full length documentary on one of the many online communities, but I think he's starting to see like the real raw potential of, of how this will affect humanity in the future. You know, the internet's only 40 years old and we just have no idea where this all is going to go. And I think that, like I said in the interview, one person who has thought a lot about it, about it and probably has the highest probability of being right is someone like the Lodges. Um, and so I was happy to share that resource with him. But it is incredible to think about just how powerful this one community in fire has gotten and how many lives it's touched. And I mean, it's not that simple. And so I don't know. I think I think the power of online communities is yet to be seen. Heck yeah. Uh, a couple of things for me real quick. First is working backwards is kind of a big skill set that I think fire teaches you. So like you said, your list exercise, what makes you happiest and then, or what's most important to you and working backwards to make sure that those have a big role in your life. And then same things working back from a desired target, desired target retirement date to identify what steps you need to take now to get there eventually, and really just any goal in general, uh, starting with the desired end result and using that to decide what to do today. And I think doing that as a couple or in any relationship, whether it's just a business or romantic relationship, having buy-in from both people is really helpful, uh, which is kind of my second takeaway, which I had this kind of, let's call it false belief that this fire stuff would really be harmful for a relationship because you're both kind of like penny pinching and not trying to do things that make you, ha well, not trying to do things that make you happy is also like a misinterpretation of the fire movement, but you're really just trying to limit the financial expenditures, which a lot of people associate with like doing fun things. And he kind of flipped that entire argument on its head because he said, because of fire, he and his wife have extremely clear values and are more aligned on what's important to them and what's important to them and what their budget is and what they can afford and what they can't afford. So it actually has less guilt about making a big purchase because they're able to explain it in a way that makes sense to both of them versus his previous way was kind of destructive. Well, she bought herself something nice and now I get to buy myself something nice. And without actually thinking, well, is the nice thing important? Does it serve what we care about? And so those conversations are paradoxically much easier. And then my third takeaway is just admiring when someone's gone so deep on a set of topics that you kind of throw all the best kind of frequently asked questions and criticisms of the movement. And not only do they handle them well, but they actually change your opinions on that. So I think that's an argument for something I'm a big advocate for, which is if you do stand on a hill, like the financial independence, retire early movement, or if you have some other personal belief system, if back to West KO, if you have some spiky argument, some way you see the world that a lot of people find disagreeable, it really does pay dividends to be extremely well-prepared thought out in advance, like answers to the questions, you know, you're going to get. Uh, and so Kyle, your first takeaway about, you know, the making more money versus saving more money, uh, his answer to that is really about sequencing, right? And like, it's, yes, you make more money eventually, 
But for most people, when they're just getting their foot in the door, which is where a lot of people are going to be when they're listening to this, right? They've just been first exposed to the movement. The sequencing of the steps you take is that your low hanging fruit is reducing your expenses. And he agrees with you, but like having a nuanced argument like that, I think is really sophisticated. And as an advocate for a movement like this or anything else like veganism or carnivore, or anything else like considered out there by the mainstream, having really well-prepared arguments like that will make you a more effective communicator and advocate for whatever you believe in. That's what I have to say for this episode with Scott Rickens. What we ask of you is if you've enjoyed this podcast and would like to listen to more, we really don't make our episodes related to anything related to anything at a specific point in time. Uh, they're evergreen content, like evergreen trees for people who haven't heard that term before. It's good all year round. It's good five years from now. The episodes from a year ago are just as good as the ones from today, besides the fact that Kyle and I are hopefully better hosts each week. That being said, I would encourage you to listen to any of our last three episodes. Talk to my grandma in 74. That was really fun. She's really cool. She's really interesting. Cole Schaefer is a poet, but he's also a really lucrative copywriter. So there's great stuff there about business. And then last week, we interviewed Joel Runyon, who has done some crazy impossible stuff. Youngest person to ever run seven ultra marathons on seven continents and a bunch of other badass misadventures. I would encourage you to check that out as well. Otherwise, say hey on social media. We're most active on Twitter and Instagram, or just stay tuned for a new episode in a week. See ya. Have a good one. Bye-bye.